Hello. Alright. So. We are continuing with a series of essays put together by Kaepernick Publishing. This is part 13, called The Hidden Pandemic. Uh, if you are unfamiliar, this is a um, essays that uh, Colin Kaepernick pulled together with Kaepernick Publishing um, from various scholars, uh, academics, lawyers, people with just lived experience, activists, uh, etc. Uh, discussing all of the different aspects of the case for police abolition. Um, that is, you know, it is a heavy topic. It is also extremely poorly understood and very poorly represented in the discourse out there. One bit of news that I think warrants mentioning in regards to this uh, is it sounds like they are working on getting this uh, digested into a book uh, which should be out later this year so it's going to take these essays and maybe more writing maybe even more writing that's been collected over the last year and actually publishing that. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Um, yeah, that just that just came out this week that they are looking at doing that. So let's get into this. Uh, well, actually, a, a forward. If you are new to this, uh, I am going to be you know reading the essay. And then you can follow along. I'll drop the link at chat. Um, but it is intended as a discussion sort of segment. So if you have thoughts, questions, anything as we're going, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, I'll be interjecting with my own thoughts as we go along as well. And I uh, hope you learn something. I always do. That's what the purpose of this is. <laughs> Catch you later, Margo. The hidden pandemic. Hidden pandemic by Kenyon Faro. Prisons are a public health crisis, and the cure is right in front of us. The best way to curb pandemics like COVID-19 is to abolish the conditions that breed their spread. As we deal with the scourge of COVID-19, which has killed more than 210,000 people. Now, again, this was written last year. Um, following the killing of George Floyd and in the midst of the height of the BLM protests. So 210,000 was the time, was the amount at the time. It has risen sharply since then. And a lot of the figures that he's going to be stating here have only gotten significantly worse since the time this essay was published. Uh, 110,000 people in Rising. Policy and public health experts are clamoring for strategies to stop the spread of the virus in absence of credible and competent leadership at the federal level. Most of what works, without a vaccine or a highly effective treatment that reduces transmission to others, uh, is known if unevenly practiced or implemented. There is inspiring work happening in the U.S. and globally around how to reduce transmission of COVID-19 or any future airborne pathogens, 
in settings like prisons, jails, and detention centers. Yet, much of what is being discussed seriously are meager reforms that would only slightly reduce the number of people in those settings, or releasing people who have comor comor comorbidities, such as old age, asthma, and heart disease, that make them more vulnerable to illness and death should they con contract COVID-19. So basically leave people who have a slight statistical advantage in there to get sick and roll the dice and let some of the others out. Some of the reforms, like the use of biometrics and regular temperature taking, despite knowing many people can carry or transmit COVID-19, even while asymptomatic, introduce more forms of surveillance into prison and jail settings. Not to mention more chances for harassment. Very few of these plans acknowledge that these spaces create opportunities for the spread of infectious diseases. If we know that to be the case, public health activists who are truly interested in social and racial justice should in fact be calling for the abolition of the prison industrial complex as a part of a strategy to reduce the possibility of current and future ep epidemics. Again, a tangent. Um, one of the things that we that has been proposed in a number of these essays and that we've continued to revisit the idea of is if you are going for a rehabilitative and restorative justice model, um, one of the best infrastructures for that to take place is a kind of contained residential community rather than a prison, which allows people who are there to live an otherwise fairly regular life and keeps them socialized keeps them active, and actually prepares them for their release back into society. This is for people who are uh, deemed too much a threat to be in society at the time of, of their uh, judgment, of their trial, where restitution is not enough, where some sort of uh, rehabilitation of the person has to take place. Um, in such a setting, you wouldn't have people cramped together. Uh, it would be more spread out. That necessitates a lot less people being in jail, so you have to adjust that. But anyway. On March 31st, the U.S. Bureau of Prisons announced the next phase of the plan to help curb COVID-19 exposure in federal prisons. Those measures included a 14-day confinement in cells. The memo states that, to the extent practicable, incarcerated people would be allowed to participate in some education and mental health services and provide labors in, labor in areas that required workers to keep the facilities running. The memo also noted that asymptomatic inmates are placed in quarantine for a minimum of 14 days or until cleared by medical staff, and symptomatic inmates are placed in isolation until they test negative for COVID-19 or cleared by medical staff as meeting CDC criteria for release from isolation. The original memo made no mention of providing masks or any other personnel or personal protective equipment to incarcerated people nor medical treatment for those who tested positive for COVID-19 until several days after the CDC's recommendation. Activist groups and some elected officials called for stronger measures to protect those in prison. Uh, Representative Gerald Nadler of New York advocated for the release of incarcerated people who are pregnant, older adults, or suffering from other conditions that would make them more vulnerable to COVID-19 complications and death. Attorney General William Barr subsequently issued such an order, 
but only focusing on federal facilities in Louisiana, Connecticut, and Ohio, all of which were already showing extremely high rates of COVID-19. State facilities and local jails have all had their own protocols for testing, treatment, and early release. What we know in hindsight since this essay was written is that this problem exploded across pretty much all states. Uh, so this half measure focusing on only three states didn't work. It did not. It may have helped a handful of people, but it didn't actually confront the problem. These measures have not been enough. In mid-August, the New York Times reported that the top 10 COVID-19 transmission clusters in the country were in prisons, jails, and detention centers. To date, uh, about 233,000 persons incarcerated and staff at these facilities have contracted the novel coronavirus, and about 1,300 of those have died. Again, these numbers got way worse since the publishing of this. I'm going to keep harping on that. So, <laughs> As alarming as those numbers are, they are incomplete. Several states have not reported key data, including the breakdown of infection rates among incarcerated per people and prison staff, or demographic data like the race of those diagnosed. There's no way to social distance. Adamu Chan, an incarcerated person inside California's infamous San, San Quentin prison, told the New York Times, We all eat together. We have a communal bathroom. There's no way to address a public health issue in an overcrowded facility. So there's two things happening here. They are simultaneously forcing all prisoners to just coexist around each other in tight spaces. And then when some of them get sick, demonstrably, where they are symptomatic, they are put in effectively isolation chambers until they run out of isolation chambers, which happened in several prisons. If you have looked into this at all, you actually know that isolation basically is a... In prison, it's basically a form of torture. Um, people who are living in isolation, like in quarantine, have means of entertaining themselves. In prison, their mechanisms for isolating people are much harsher and uh, really don't take any sort of concern for the mental well-being of those incarcerated and those being isolated from interacting with people. And interaction doesn't have to be physical. I just have to make that clear. You can safely distance and quarantine sick individuals while still having them engaged in socializing. We have all kinds of technology for doing that. But anyway. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in carceral settings, the incomplete reporting of data, and the minimal public health and health care standards being uniformly implemented is no surprise to anyone who has been inside a facility, as a loved one who is or was imprisoned, or works as staff. Prisons, jails, and detention centers themselves are well known to be incubators of infectious disease outbreaks. This is not the fault of those confined in carceral settings, but rather is a result of how societies view people whom they send to such places of forced confinement. And to condemn one to such a facility is to judge not just their actions, but their person. Children, yeah, literally, yeah. Uh, isolation, yes. 
you and recognizes it as a form of torture, which, uh, yeah, it absolutely is. Um, it has been well documented to cause... Um, to cause extreme mental duress uh, and mental breaks. So punishment is not just taking away freedom of movement. It is forcing people into conditions of squalor, places that are overcrowded, violent, without access to adequate, let alone high quality, health care, all intended to be part and parcel of the sentence itself. It's a se sentence to violence, deprivation, illness, physical and psychological, and spiritual, and sometimes premature death. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 40%, nearly half, of all people in prison reported having a chronic, a current chronic health condition, while over half said that they have had a chronic medical condition at some point in their lives. 21% of the people in prison and 14% of people in jail reported ever having tuberculosis, hep B or C, or other STDs. HIV rates in prisons are five to seven times higher than in the general population. There's a lot to unpack there, because that's a lot of information, but I want to add a little bit more context to it. In many cases, this is stuff that is being spread while they are in prison. And uh, that is what's specifically being highlighted in this article, where a lot of the chronic conditions and a lot of the spread of things like hepatitis, tuberculosis, STDs, etc. is part of being in this overcrowded environment where people are treated like animals, crowded into corrals, and basically given no protection from each other, even. Um, where violence is kind of encouraged and responded to with more violence. But there's a flip side to this where people who are not in that incarcerated population who happen to become very ill are put into a destitute position because of a completely broken healthcare system where they cannot get the treatment that they need and they end up falling into completely crippling debt, setting them up to have a, you know, that desperation that can lead to criminal activity, trying to survive. So people who are ill end up more having, you know, more likely to end up in jail simply because of that mechanism at the state and local levels public health officials most often have no legal authority to implement or enforce sanitation medical care food water and air quality inside facilities despite what might be written into state law or other codes of operation for carceral settings it usually takes lawsuits on behalf of incarcerated people to enforce medical care, basic sanitation, or other public health measures. Federally, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention only provides guidelines for public health policies and procedures carceral settings and have no enforcement authority over the Bureau of Prisons. 
these decisions about public health and health care, mostly left to state departments of corrections, are often down to the whims of the warden to implement or not. Medical staff are often part-time and may not be qualified to provide care to people. If you are running a prison and you are having to balance your budget because of how they're run, basically like businesses a lot of times, you can imagine how cutting corners on things that are not actually in force, that don't have teeth, would be a very easy thing to step into. I phrase it like that because, again, I reject the notion that, like, everyone at every step of these structures is themselves personally, like, malicious. But, as I've talked about several times, the incentives are there to do cruel behaviors not actually care for the prison population. The incentives are there to shortchange them and to set them up to fail when they are released. When you have systems, bureaucratic systems, and they have many people involved and many hands involved, you don't analyze what the people involved want to do. You analyze what the system is incentivized to do, because it will trend towards that in spite of the desires of those in charge. There is pressure in systems. So. Continuing on. Found a really good article with lots of data on how the business incentive is breaking things. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in that. I would be very interested in that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, at all. And it's why... It, it's central to why just trying to adjust with reforms isn't really enough. You have to fundamentally change what drives these overarching systems. You, you have to utterly change the foundation of them so that they are incentivized towards behaving in an effective and positive manner that helps communities rather than arms them. Basically driving massive inflation of pre yeah. Pre-trial detention um, is it's a huge business. Uh, there's a the whole bail system and such there is there is a ton of money in that. There is a lot of incentive to carry it out. It looks good on paper. Uh, from the, you know, my department is making this many arrests this, you know, this quarter or whatever. It doesn't matter if those actually get convicted. They're reporting the arrests, they're reporting the crimes themselves that are reported. Because, you know, after it leaves that, it enters into a different set of statistics. And those two statistics aren't analyzed together very effectively. Yeah. Really, that people held pretrial more likely to... Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. As, especially because... Um, They are 
there's this negotiation that happens uh, where the person who is being held pre-trial um, they have all this time in a jail where they are constantly having pressure asserted on them um, from people who have pretty much absolute control over their day-to-day -day existence um, to to do exactly that to just plead guilty and um, and go along with things uh, that leads that has led to a number of people who are innocent pleading guilty as well as we have found out from several people even on death row We get into this. Uh, okay. I just want to stay say before I read this part. I I I hate this subject. I hate this part. Um, hate everything about this story. The recent scandal at an immigration detention center in southern Georgia demonstrates this. Don Wooten, the licensed practical nurse who worked at the center, is the whistleblower in the case against the facility where Mahendra Amin, medical doctor, allegedly performed non-consensual hysterectomies on scores of women. If true, not only is this a serious abuse of power, and in fact a violation of medical ethics and human rights, but Amin is not certified by any of the 24 member boards of the American Board of Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology, according to news reports. While forced sterilization has a long history and has been fought primarily by reproductive and disability justice activists, mostly black and brown feminists, people in prisons, jails, and detention centers are often the most vulnerable still to these practices. This is not surprising. It is not uncommon for many facilities to employ doctors who do not have the training to perform certain kinds of medical care in carceral settings. Also, some doctors may take those jobs to abuse populations that have little power or access to systems of accountability. Putin also alleged in her complaint that the conditions in the facility did not meet standards to best prevent the spread of COVID-19, nor did it even meet the standards for basic human decency. There is an unknowable number of cases of people who die in custody every year or being denied access to life-saving care. In recent years, several people with HIV in immigration detention facilities were denied access to their antiretroviral medication and subsequently died, most notably transgender activist Roxana Hernandez in 2018. On paper, many, many states have removed the death penalty, have removed capital punishment from their legal system. However, what we find out is that even though there is not a legal mechanism for prisoners to be condemned to death, they are de facto condemned to death or medical experimentation yeah absolutely is a argument for it being small-scale genocide and mind you Even in states which do hold to capital punishment, and typically those who believe in it, only believe in it for the most egregious of crimes. 
these are for basically anyone who is imprisoned. Jails systemically have these conditions that lead to these outcomes. So you can have a completely nonviolent offender dying because the detention center decided they didn't need their insulin or what have you. Or just not wanting to provide it for them because too expensive or whatever. Plus, by definition, innocent in a facility like that. Yeah. Um, especially if you're talking about a lot of those pretrial uh, detentions. Where people can be subjected to these kinds of conditions for months or even years before ever setting foot in a courtroom and having their case heard. Oh yeah, immigrant facility, yes. Immig immigrant facilities are, by definition, people who have not committed crimes. They're not being held in jails, they're just being held because we have a completely, utterly dysfunctional immigration system. So yeah, you're completely correct there. So, in short, if you oppose capital punishment for people who have not actually been convicted of a crime, you oppose the prison system. Because that's what the prison system enacts in its current incarnation. It would need to be fundamentally rebuilt in order to avoid these outcomes. I find that to be a pretty compelling case. Let's see. This is Die Hargrove in Mermaid Park in uh, Winmore, Pennsylvania. Hargrove reflected on her time incarcerated at Riverside Correctional Facility. A jail cell, that's not a place for human beings, period. It doesn't rehabilitate, it doesn't correct. Caging is a ritual of dehumanization, and with COVID-19, it could mean death. The only answer is freedom. That is an activist in her community for Black Lives and LGBTQIA rights, as well as being an actor and a comedian. Whether it's COVID-19, hepatitis, tuberculosis, or other infectious disease outbreaks that are regularly occurring inside carceral settings, we have to begin to think about these issues in constitutive, as constitutive of the prison industrial complex, not as aberrant. The best strategy to help curb the spread of infectious disease and promote health among all people residing in the U.S. is to begin to put the same kind of energy, resources, and intellectual thought into what role a future without prisons can play in a future without COVID-19 and other pandemics. Bacteria and viruses will always exist and cause disease, but the conditions that breed pandemics are most often human-made. You're going to bed? Okay. Okay. Ending pandemics is, not, is going to take not only calls to defund the police or abolish the prison industrial complex, but to also plan for a new social contract. One that devises community developed systems that provide for lives of dignity and joy and minimize violence, greed, and deprivation. Our carceral system renders those who are locked in it as 
outside the parameters of citizens, of community members, and even outside the notions of the public. I like this framing very much. I hate that this is correct and it's very chilling, but I like the way it's worded and the way that it, that uh, Pharaoh writes about this. Our carceral system renders those who are locked in it as outside the parameters of citizens, of community members, and even outside notions of the public. All of which is true. Especially if you look into how people talk about prisoners, how the media talks about those who are imprisoned and the criminal population, they are always treated as kind of a plague that the public needs to be defended against, rather than individuals whom tragically have gone this road and that we want to resolve what drove them there to whatever their situation is and get them back into living among everyone else. You know, back into living with their community and supporting it and being a positive force. I like I like the idea of the new social contract. In order for public health to not ring as a meaningless phrase, we have to begin to tackle public health from an abolitionist framework and not only expressed care and or concern for the people on the outside who are not in prison now or are not rendered as reasons for the carceral state to exist in the first place. Black, Latino, Native American, poor, homeless, queer, immigrant, transgender, sex worker, drug user, or dealer. All of those populations are constantly, constantly vilified and used to prop up propaganda and push this narrative of we have to protect you know, society from them. Um, this is especially true, especially true in more conservative and right-wing rhetoric, but liberal re rhetoric falls into a lot of these traps as well. It is a, a very deep, implicit bias that exists in a lot, uh, at a lot of levels in society right now that has to be addressed. Our planning for future life should not end with our desire for the return of boozy brunches and Taco Tuesdays. We should be planning for a future for human life. Prisons, jails, and detention centers are the antithesis of that by design. Okay. That was the hidden pandemic. Part 13 of 30 in Abolition for the People by Kaepernick Publishing. A lot of good thoughts, as always. Next week we'll be on 14. We're almost halfway through. Taking our time with these, but they're important subjects. 
and they warrant a deeper discussion than just throwing around slogans.